Euromax highlights. And here's your host, Louise Houghton. Hello and welcome to another Euromax highlight show. We've picked some of the very best stories from the past week and here's a sample of what's coming up. Designing ways, architect Norman Foster displays his favourite art in a French museum. All aboard, the new cruise ship MS Europa 2 makes its maiden voyage. And what a doll. We take a look at Barbie's dream house here in Berlin. The name Norman Foster is synonymous with some of the most impressive building constructions in the world. But what many people might not know about this British architect is that he's also a keen art collector. This month, he opened an exhibition of his favourite pieces at a museum that he also designed 20 years ago. This is the Carré d'Art in the southern French city of Nîmes. It houses a museum of contemporary art and the city library. It faces a Roman temple that dates back to the first century BC. To celebrate the 20th anniversary of the completion of the Carré, Sir Norman Foster has organized an exhibition of some of his favorite artwork. The exhibition is entitled Moving. It's very intuitive. So if a work of art moves me emotionally or intellectually, then that is the criteria for the choice. Hence the name moving. Foster has brought together works created by the cream of the international art world, including China's Ai Weiwei, Italian sculptor Umberto Boccioni, and Germany's Gerhard Richter. Museums from all over the world have lent artworks for the exhibition. German visual artist Andreas Gorski is also represented here. The connections between art, architecture, design, the design of cars, aircraft, furniture, is one totality. Obviously, here I have to split them, um, so I concentrate on art. But with my family, I live with the work of artists, and in a way this is perhaps a continuation of the way that I view art. Art lovers were fascinated at the idea of one of the world's great architects presenting artworks in one of his own buildings. The design is vintage Foster, elaborate and translucent. In fact, the library section uses almost exclusively natural light. It's a nine-story structure, but five of the floors are underground. Foster's choices of artwork can be found throughout the building. For example, this installation by Olo Eliasson. I think it's an inspiration. I think the links are perhaps more subliminal than... Um, uh, so I don't think you can see a, a, an immediate direct connection, but certainly there are connections for me as, a, as an architect. In 1967, Foster founded the architectural firm that still bears his name and employs a staff of more than a thousand. Foster's legendary works include the Swiss Re headquarters building in London, better known as the Gherkin, and the Hearst Tower in New York City. The Millot Viaduct in France, and the Dome of the Reichstag building in Berlin. But if we think of the Reichstag, the Reichstag is inseparable as an architectural work from the contributions of the many artists Foster's exhibition at the Carré d'Art also features the work of lesser-known artists that have attracted his attention. He finds their work moving, in keeping with the theme of the exhibition, and he wants it to reach a wider audience. He has his own ideas about art, and you can see that at the exhibition. It's what he wants to show, not what's hot with the critics right now. Berlin artist Daniel Lergon decorated this huge wall in the foyer of the Carré d'Art. It contains a number of references to Foster's architectural designs. The museum is a very open structure, not just in an architectural sense. There's a library, activities for children on the first floor, and the museum above that. I think the structure is very interesting. It took Sir Norman Foster nine years to plan and design the Carré d'Art. 
He says the exhibition has given him the opportunity to see the structure in brand new ways. I, I, I return um, and uh, see it in its many different moods with different exhibitions. Uh, and for me, that's very, very important process, excuse me, a very important part of the process of designing to see how a building weathers over time, how it changes with time, how it adapts. So it's all part of a continuous learning process. This unique blend of art and architecture will be open to the public through September 15th. The MS Europa has long been a stylish ship to board for a cruise. And now its sister ship, the MS Europa 2, has just taken to the water after being built in a French shipyard. The experience on board is meant to be a little more relaxed than on MS Europa, but it is certainly still one of the most luxurious ways to travel across the seas. It's the perfect time for a ship's maiden voyage. The port of Hamburg is celebrating its 824th anniversary and more than a million visitors have arrived for the party. One of the main attractions is the new Hapag Lloyd luxury liner Europa 2. It's not the world's largest cruise ship, but it is one of the most luxuriously appointed. There are spacious accommodations for 516 passengers in a total of 258 suites. Two days before the ship set sail, crew members were making the final preparations. Johann Schrempf is the Europa's hotel manager. He held a similar post on the Europa's sister ship. The goal here is to offer passengers laid-back luxury. We don't have a traditional captain's dinner or formal receptions. We take a more relaxed approach, especially as far as the dress code is concerned. Schrempf takes us to one of the ship's two owner's suites. Each covers 116 square meters. The price is available only on request, but experts say it's probably close to 6,000 euros per person per day. Schrempf is in charge of making sure that all the guest accommodations are in perfect order. When we come into or out of a port, we've got to be fairly quick. The pressure's high. And there's always the chance that we'll overlook something. So I double-check certain areas just to make sure that everything's OK. The suites employ a subtle color scheme, relaxing earth tones of brown, tan and grey, with accents of violet and mauve. The ship's interior was designed by Kai Bunger and Siegfried Schindler. They're making a last-minute check as well, to make sure that everything has gone to plan. We've been on board for two days now, checking out some specifics, like the settings for the lighting. We did some fine-tuning and realigned some of the fixtures so that they properly bring out the interiors. We really do check the smallest details. We have to. The passengers can sense this attention to detail, even if they're not aware of every single aspect. They sense it, and that creates a balanced interior. The spa covers more than 620 meters on deck five. There's plenty of room, both inside and out on the deck. Deck four features the dining and entertainment areas. There are eight restaurants in all, several bars, a jazz club, as well as a theater with room for more than 400 patrons. The final checks have gone without a hitch, and the ship's captain, Jan Ackermann, predicts the maiden voyage will too. The important thing is to make sure that the crew really get to know the workings of the ship. I think that's the most exciting thing about a first voyage. 
Last minute preparations are also underway below deck. Stefan Wilke is the ship's head chef. He's in charge of preparing gourmet meals for each of the Europa's eight restaurants. I think I get this from my mother. I'm always at the right place at the right time. The food's ready and all I have to do is just sit down and eat. That's fabulous. The Europa 2 was officially christened last Friday night. The next morning, the ship sailed out of the port of Hamburg on its maiden voyage, a 10-day cruise to the Portuguese capital, Lisbon. Well, if you prefer a more active way of getting about, then cycling is a healthy and much greener way to do that. Nowadays, though, it seems people want the bikes themselves to be, to be more environmentally friendly. So makers are using materials that are more common to Asia, like wood and bamboo, to make more durable frames and even wheels. It seems that these chic green bikes are all the rage here in Europe. This is Alkmaar, north of Amsterdam. Bicycles are the favorite mode of transport here. Most of them are sit-up-and-beg Dutch bikes. But there are other kinds, too. Like this chunky-looking bow bike, made of solid oak. It's the brainchild of Dutch designer and boat builder Jan Kuneweg. Every piece is, is uh, different. Uh, so every bicycle is also your own bicycle. You will recognize them in a lot of different bicycles because that's your um, structure uh, on, on the bike. Kuneweg built his first bow bike a year ago. 250 of these durable machines have been produced since then. They weigh about 20 kilos and cost around 1,500 euros. Yeah, I re really like to bring people closer to nature, especially in the city, because I think uh, they, um, they don't um, recognize them how, uh, where, where we came from. And uh, we, we will be much happier when we are close to nature. Bikes made of sustainable raw materials are growing in popularity. The Amsterdam sandwich bike comes in a flat pack. Britain Andy Martin's bike is made of bent wood originally designed for German furniture maker Tonet. And the handmade Waldmeister bike from southern Germany is made out of beech wood. Bremen bike builder Tobias Meyer has gone for a more exotic material, bamboo. The frames weigh two to three kilos and are as robust as metal ones. And a bamboo bike is certainly an eye-catcher. The rims and pedals and everything are made out of metal, so it probably rides well. It might even be lighter. It looks good, very natural. I assume it's stable. Bamboo is really strong. Meyer uses steel lugs and other metal components for his bikes. He's been making them for about four years. It can take hours to choose the right bamboo poles for a frame. If you look at these two poles, for example, they look pretty similar in section. But this one has a much thinner wall thickness. And that means that despite looking similar, these poles would give a completely different riding feel. If I take this pole, the frame would be a bit stiffer. This one would be a gentler ride. It takes him a week to build a bike. The most time-intensive part of the process is the filing down of the poles so they fit, and joining them with flex tape. He sells his bikes for 2,700 euros plus. His Faserwerk brand includes all the usual styles. Nowadays, you can see that people really pay attention to their own style on bikes. They've been thinking about the optics and aesthetics of the bike they ride. It's more than a means of transport. It's a kind of status symbol. All bikes from Fraserwerk are made to order. Their unique appearance and the environmentally friendly materials are just two reasons why people buy them. 
in spite of the price. If you look at rising fuel costs, then that's reason enough for more and more people to turn to cheaper alternatives. And bikes are quite clearly the cheapest. It doesn't get much cheaper than this bike made of recycled cardboard by Israeli engineer Isar Gafni. It only costs seven euros to make. And the Spanish firm Lola Afe uses old car parts to make its bikes. Back to Alkmaar, where Jan Hunevek hopes that his sustainably built bike will have a long-term impact on those who ride it. I really like that people uh, just relax on this bike, uh, be moved by nature, and uh, I think it's a wonderful slogan for this bike. Whether it's made of wood, bamboo, or scrap, designers are making green transport even greener with every new idea. Well, from man-made materials, we turn to plastic and the toy doll Barbie. There are many who say that her image is plastic as well, and it puts a lot of pressure on young girls to be perfect and glamorous. Barbie's been around for 64 years now, though, and has fans of all ages, many of who have flocked to her new life-sized home that's just opened to the public here in Berlin. Barbie has got a foothold on the Berlin property market, but only until the end of August. Tickets to enter the mobile mansion of the world's most famous doll cost 12 euros. Inside, there are a number of diversions. Visitors can bake virtual cupcakes. Check out the state-of-the-art makeup range. Or admire Barbie's expansive wardrobe. They're also welcome to spend their money in the Barbie boutique. So what do the customers think? Nice. Wonderful. It's beautiful and pink and big, like a child's dream come true. It's a bit too colorful. For some, Barbie's dream house feels more like a nightmare. Gender studies researcher Stevie Schmiedel has been investigating attitudes towards Barbie. Barbie's been enormously successful because she represents something unattainable. She's tall, blonde and blue-eyed, a stereotype of the unachievable female ideal. Barbie expresses the idea that you always have to make yourself beautiful and that beauty means power. And of course, that's wrong. Barbie, along with her unrealistic bodily proportions, has long been a controversial figure. The world's best-selling doll first appeared on the market in 1959. She's become world-renowned. Bettina Dorfmann from Dusseldorf owns 15,000 Barbies, a world record. 19 years ago, she decided to get some of her old dolls repaired for her daughter. When she failed to find anyone up to the task, she started restoring Barbies herself. Her collection began to grow. I almost always had Barbie with me when I was a child, and that's what makes it all so much fun for me, to relive that period. She always reflects the spirit of the age, and she's slightly ahead of her time. Bettina Dorfmann also owns the oldest Barbie on the planet, worth about 8,000 euros. Ruth Handler, founder of US toy company Mattel, based Barbie on the design of shop mannequins. Two years later, Ken arrived on the scene. Barbie's image was beginning to change. Some famous names have designed clothes for Barbie. The diminutive diva has always been a trendsetter. Here we have the trends of the 1960s. You've got their tight skirts, the covered knees, and especially this bouffant hairstyle. Back then, every woman sported this style. Bettina Dorfmann has turned her hobby into a profession. She curates exhibits like this one in Bergkamen in northern Germany, devoted to fashion and glamour. Various Barbies are on display from all different races and even special editions like film stars Audrey Hepburn and Marilyn Monroe. Barbie has many faces, including the presidential candidate, the astronaut, or the soldier. Bettina Dorfmann thinks criticism is misplaced. Barbie is beautiful. She has ideal proportions. If I take off her clothes, she's just an object. Then she looks like a seamstress's mannequin. And children know that. 
People don't love Barbie, they love the image and accessories connected to her. And Barbie's glamour is attracting people to the dream house in Berlin. That's why you'll be hard pressed to find a Barbie in a mechanic's overalls. And the visitors like what they see. The organizers are expecting 10,000 per week. The dream house represents the pinkification that we're currently experiencing. Girls are being raised to identify with pink and boys with blue. Unfortunately, Barbie tells girls to be cute and sweet. They're supposed to become supermodels. Great. But the dream house does also show that pink doesn't have to be just for girls. The exhibit was designed by a man. And we continue now with a sport that's dominated by men too. White collar boxing is the newest trend in a number of German cities and is attracting the likes of managers, lawyers and businessmen who use the same principles in and outside the ring. Courage, responsibility and sheer determination to win. Boxing is the sport of kings and of businessmen. The White Collar Boxing Club in Hamburg sees boxing as a way to offset the stress of the office. The competitive aspect doesn't play an important role here. Architect Matthias Seiberlich joined the club about a year ago. His friends and family noticed the difference. My wife approves because I'm more relaxed and it helps me get in better physical shape. My friends think it's a good thing, too. They were worried that we'd be hitting each other in the face. But with the right protective gear and coaching, it's fine. The boxers have to undergo rigorous training before they're ready for a bout. They learn coordination and timing. Coach Tim Albrecht's pointers are short and clear. The former kickboxers fitness club specializes exclusively in boxing. Boxing has had an upward trend for about 10 years now, thanks to Henry Maske and the Klitschko brothers. I see that in the increasing membership here. Matthias Seiberlich is among the newer members. He's currently refurbishing this apartment building, and he says the job requires creativity and precision. But physical fitness is also important in his line of work. I was struggling with a painful slip disc for almost nine months, which forced me to cut down my activities so much that boxing turned into a sort of escape from all that. Senior executives and decision makers often face lots of stress and pressure. They have to learn to keep their emotions under control. Psychologist and business coach Dennis Brodbeck advises his clients to learn a combat sport. He also coaches the Japanese martial art Aikido. Don't let the little problems of daily life rattle you. Practice fending off the big ones through sports. If you don't get upset when you really get attacked and thrown to the ground, then everyday problems won't bother you anymore. White-collar boxing is a good way for executives to let off steam. I have a stressful job. I have a virtual team worldwide that I just talk to on the phone. If they don't do what I want, I get mad. Before I start knocking in heads, I'd rather come here and let it out constructively. After six months of training, Matthias Seiberlich feels ready for his first sparring match. He's also prepared to face his opponent. Let me see a jab, Matthias. Discipline, precision, and a healthy portion of aggression are all qualities that an executive needs outside the boxing ring as well. There are a lot of parallels between boxing and working life, especially in management or in banks and jobs like that. You have to be able to act fast and spontaneously and take risks. You have all of that in boxing, too. Matthias Seiberlich felt euphoric when he discovered those qualities in himself. He says he's going to stick with boxing. 
Well, I'm not sure how good I would be at it, but it looks a great way to release stress constructively. Thanks for joining us today, everyone, but it is now time to say goodbye. So, until next time, as we say here in Germany, tschüss. <laughs>